Christopher Shaberg is a Dorothy Harold Brown Distinguished Professor of English at Loyola University. He is the author of several books, including The Textual Life of Airports and The End of Airports. He is also the series co-editor of Bloomsbury's Object Lessons. On our show, he talks about one of his newest books, Searching for the Anthropocene, which blends personal narrative, cultural criticism, and ecological thought to ponder human-driven catastrophe on a planetary scale. We discuss how the climate crisis is portrayed in the media, the role capitalism is playing in it, how the younger generation is responding, and how we view ourselves in relation to the environment. Take a listen. Welcome to the Bloomsbury Academic Podcast. I'm your host, Rebecca Morovsky, and today I'm speaking with Chris Schaeberg, the author of Searching for the Anthropocene. Welcome, Chris. Thanks so much for being on the show. Yeah. Hi, Rebecca. Thanks so much for having me. To get started, I wanted to ask, what motivated you to write a book about the Anthropocene, and when did you become aware of it as a concept? I can't really remember exactly when I became aware of the concept, but I think it sort of... um, dawned on me over the past, I mean, over the past decade, that that this was what I, that the Anthropocene was what I was writing about. I had been working on this book about my my home region of Michigan for quite some time, but in some ways, when I realized it was actually a book on the Anthropocene, that, that helped me focus what the book was about, um, um, which, which ended up being a much more sprawling topic than just my home region or environmental aesthetics. So it just sort of gradually, um, I would say, subsumed the book. So there's lots of different definitions of the Anthropocene. You resist defining it in the beginning of the book and you use this, you know, the entire book to explore exactly what it means. But as a heuristic for people listening, how exactly would you define it? Yeah. So, I mean, I guess the easiest way to define it is just the, the geologic age defined by human impact or maybe put more bluntly, human destruction of the planet. So when we can sort of become either vividly aware of that or whether or when or at the point that we can't deny that, that it's sort of encroaching all around us. So that sense that that human degradation of the planet is is sort of underneath everything. And have you had a lot of experience in the past writing about the environment? Um, What's your, if so, what's your experience been and what have the biggest challenges been? Yeah, I mean, the the funny thing was I I wrote um, three books about airports, um, which seem maybe far afield from this topic. But in fact, all of those books were really conditioned by uh, thinking through ecological questions and um, environmental uh, considerations around air travel. So in a way, I, I think I'd been writing in this vein for quite some time, but never never explicitly at, as environmental humanities really until this book. Um, so so it's, 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 it's something I've been thinking about. The topic has been in my mind for a while, even before it, it, it became clear as being uh, specifically environmental theoretical project or about the Anthropocene per se. Mm. Yeah, I mean, you mentioned you've written a, quite a few books about airports. And, and in this book specifically, you have a, a, a huge section about flying and airports and space travel. And you argue that they're sort of emblematic of living in the Anthropocene. Um, how so? Yeah, I, I was watching this airport, this new terminal being built outside of my hometown of New Orleans. And I was paying attention to the rhetoric around it and the boosterism around it. And it, at the same time, New Orleans faces all kinds of um, environmental challenges and, and imminent catastrophes. And it, it just struck me as so profoundly strange that, that we were building this airport as if it would just sort of last and thrive and promote economic growth for the next you know, 50 years, let's say, when the short term actually feels much more dire. And so I, I started tuning into that airport specifically, but then thinking about air travel and space travel more generally as this very, um, this very large cultural and I think psychological blind spot that, that humans 
have right now where we, 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 we are participating in this very modern mode of transportation that we, we either assume or want to persist basically the same as it is for the, for the ongoing decades. But, for any number of reasons, whether it's, um, you know, fuel resources or, um, climatological shifts, like it's, we're probably going to have to adjust the ways that we travel, um, for one reason or another. And so it seemed to me to be this, this kind of looming contradiction. Hmm. Yeah. There, there was this one part in your book that I found quite striking where you were looking at advertisements for future airports. And there was this this part about, you know, boasting of airports or airlines that are sort of preparing for the imminent doom of climate change. They're building upon their current structures to uh, withstand the most drastic parts of climate change instead of doing things in the present to actually prevent it from happening in the first place. Yeah, right. That's absolutely right. Yeah, we, we saw these like token gestures like, oh, we're you know, we're, we're developing new, uh, you know, uh, jet engines that will be, you know, 4% more efficient or, you know, or airlines themselves, you know, we're, you know, we're introduced like compost, compostable napkins, you know, and just all these kind of preposterous, tiny measures, while really the, the overall effort there is like, let's just keep it all the same, because everything's going to stay the same with our economic model and our mode of transportation. So yeah, I, I really kind of focus in on those, the those um, kind, of, kind of ludicrous um, uh, measures that are or, or gestures toward, you know, sustainability or resilience that, that seem to me mostly hollow. I guess the looming monster or the looming beast or undercurrent throughout this book is is the role that global capitalism plays in all of this. Right. I mean, it's right. not just airports, but just all, how we're confronting climate change overall. Um, how for you did capitalism play a role within the critiques of your book? I think seeing, uh, understanding the ways that capitalism is uh, on some really base level, it's the, this, this commitment to just growing growth, just that you can grow an economic, um, model of extraction or exploitation and, 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 grow the distance between the wealthiest and the people with with the least and 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 just realizing that that's it's simply not possible there are there are certain limits that that we are already running into and so so then looking for these places around culture where that com- that sort of that bullheaded commitment to growth the growth of growth where where that exists and how and then trying to kind of poke at that a little bit and seeing seeing where where we can find the 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 paradoxes or the 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 short-sightedness so i look for that you know whether it's like in my hometown in little um you know small kind of local areas or whether that's in something distributed widely like like blue apron um you know meal services or even down to like little tiny amenity kits on airplanes and and looking for the rhetoric of growth and, and growing wealth and well-being against the reality of, of, you know, limited resources and limited, limited life support on a limited planet. Hmm. Right. Can you expand upon the example you used in the book um, with blue apron? Yeah. I, I, I feel kind of bad about that one because I, 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 I had one of my student assistants reading that one and she, and she sort of gave me some crap for it. And she's like, you know, not everyone who uses these meal services is, is, is using them to just, you know, promote this, this e- extractive um, logic of capitalism. Some people are just trying to like get by and like squeeze a little bit of time out of their already like soul crushed lives in within capitalism. And I was like, yeah, you're right. That's a good point. So I, I was, I, I was, yeah, I was trying to think about that one. I mean, I think with Blue Apron, there's the there's the ideal form of like this perfect meal that you can get every night. And but that's, of course, based on this economic model that is very profitable for Blue Apron. So even just there, it was a very kind of simple way for me to think about um, the kind of a fantasy image of something delivered to you every day that would make your life perfect. But then the the economic backdrop of that, which which is about um which is about stretching this this very um, model of 
of life in a in an unsustainable way where where the the the, the profiters um, will continue to to profit hugely and the people who are stretched for time will be stretched further and further and further. I mean, in your defense, I don't think it comes off as you attacking consumers. I think you're attacking an industry that is exploiting the fact that people don't <laughs> have time to make full meals themselves and, and they're, they're dipping and they're exploiting the capitalist model, which, you know, we all exist within. Um, so, I mean, that's the way that it came off to me. So I don't, I don't think you're necessarily like attacking people who use Blue Apron as much as you are attacking the reason it exists in the first place. You know, well, I'm relieved. I mean, I, and I hope that's true also for like the section on Uber or any of the others. And I mean, for air travel, too. I mean, I, I still I'm, I'm trying to travel by air less and less, but I'm still I still get sort of woven into that matrix. I'm in no way innocent um, in all this. Yeah. But thanks. <laughs> I mean, I'm certainly not innocent either. And it's, uh, air travel in particular is such a complicated issue because it's it has such a social benefit. You know, it, mm -hmm. it's made the world smaller. We live on different sides of the planet from our friends and our family. So in some ways, it's it's fostered a, a closer or more intimate sense of community in such a globalized planet. But of course, its environmental toll is one of the most drastic that, you know, compared to other forms of um, energy consumption that there is, really. Yeah. Yeah. There was even an article in The New York Times, I think, um, maybe a month or two ago that said, you know, um, air tra what if air travel is good for, you know, climate awareness? And the argument was that, like, by traveling, people can actually appreciate the world and learn about why it's important to care about the world. And so, you know, I thought, I mean, that's an I don't finally buy that argument, but I think it, it's it certainly speaks to the fact that like, yes, we're, we're in this and we have to kind of work with it. We, it may not be as simple as just disavowing it absolutely, you know, tomorrow, but rather, you know, what would it mean to work with this, with this thing that's, that's brought us certain, um, yeah, closeness, connection, awareness, but then also maybe ramp it down. Hmm. Do you have any ideas or is that sort of a rhetorical question in your book? Yeah, I think it's kind of a, a floating rhetorical question. I mean, I think it's it's one that not any not I don't think any airlines or aircraft manufacturers or airports, for that matter, are going to be um, keen on really contemplating it again for the very reason that it has to be about growth, not not like reduction, just based on you know the economic model that that we're working within. But I do think it's one that that we either start asking seriously or or it's going to be like a, you know a very a sudden emergency situation where there's not going to be time to make any you know more conscious um changes to the to the current infrastructure or systems at work and on that note i mean there's one quote in your book that i thought was very telling you say acknowledging the anthropocene is one step towards recognizing the problem uh, can you explain exactly what that means? And, and do you feel that as a culture, you know, maybe specifically in the United States, that we are acknowledging the Anthropocene? I mean, hopefully starting to. And I do. I, I was I was a little um, torn. Right. Even writing this book and, and having the title be about the Anthropocene, because I'm not you know, I, I, I'm not convinced it's the best name for this or that it's, you know, has scientific, you know, sort of rigorous data behind it in the ways that some people would want. Um, but I do think it's useful. I think it has a, a function right now to bring a kind of um, large scale awareness to the extent of the problem. And so uh, I, I, I came to peace with having this book, um, you know, framed and titled this way, because I realized, look, this is, we do need more narratives and more explorations of this, even if we kind of also accept it as an imperfect or working concept, it's something that needs to, to, uh, jar audiences. And at one point I was, I was teaching a class as I was finishing the book and I asked my students, I said, have any of you heard this term, the Anthropocene, have anyone heard it? And none of my students had, and that was a moment where I was like, Oh, okay, I guess it is really good that I'm writing this book because 
inevitably then I have conversations with my students about what I'm working on and this concept and what it means. And then once they've heard it, they tend to do things with it, you know, whether it's weave it into their, their own creative works or critical works or art projects. And so um, I think that sort of disseminating the concept is a really critical part of, of building awareness and then, and hopefully changing how we, how we act on the planet. Speaking of art projects and uh, works, I mean, how, how do you feel that literature and the humanities can help us work through the tensions of our current existential crisis? Does it play a particularly special role for you? It does. It, it's increasingly a, I would almost say a therapeutic uh, role for me personally. I mean, th- this part of the book is is interested in, especially toward the end, in, in looking at at new media technologies and the ways that some of these these technologies um, even exacerbate the acceleration of all of all of the the economic models we were talking about. And so for me, literature has been has become increasingly this mode or this way of of slowing down and and teaching students how to slow down and then start to reassess the world around us. And that sounds, it sounds kind of quaint and even nostalgic, and I don't mean it that way at all. I just mean that more and more reading literature in the classroom with students feels quite radical. It feels like a kind of intervention that we, we, it, it's harder and harder to find that just in life, those moments of just like sheer awkward pause where you don't know what to do with what you're looking at because we have these little magical devices that figure everything out for us so quickly. And, mm. and literature just resists that at every turn. I mean, it, it, at least at its best. And so I find myself really relishing the, you know, the, 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 the very simple classroom structure where we are reading a, a poem that none of us have read before and just working with that. Um, and I mean, all of my classes end up being environmental in, in one way or another. But it, certainly if we're if if we're if we're in a class that's talking about environmental awareness or environmental um, aesthetics, then that's even more uh, heightened of an experience. What are some of your favorite examples of environmental literature that you share with your students? Well, or is that um, too hard a question? <laughs> no, I mean, it's a good question, but I, I think I've. I, I think another I'm 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 kind of writing about this in in the I'm working on this new book called Pedagogy of the Depressed and it's it really I, I also had this realization that the searching for the Anthropocene is in some ways a follow up to my last book which was called The Work of Literature in an Age of Post Truth which is kind of exactly what you were talking about a second ago and my new book Pedagogy of the Depressed is really picking up right where Searching for the Anthropocene ends up and I think. So one of the things I've been writing about in this new book is the experience of really encountering um, literature in the classroom that is not only new to all my students, but to me. So one of the things I've been doing, this sounds um, maybe just just sort of um, easy or opportunistic, but I, it's actually quite challenging and, and, and really fun, is to read with my students, for instance, just like whatever whatever the poems are in in like this week's New Yorker, we would read those. And I have no idea what's going to be there and they don't know what's going to be there, but we read them and just kind of try to work with them and understand what, what are they doing here? Why now? What is the, like, how are these, these texts, um, how are they pushing us in, in ways that we need to respond to? And, and often, I mean, contemporary poems are, um, a lot of contemporary poems are tuned into um, issues of whether it's social justice or political urgency or ecological um you know, disaster. So we get ourselves into those conversations through these poems that we don't even know we're going to be like, we don't know what we're going to be encountering. So I think that's weirdly my my favorite kind of literature to read with my students is literature that I don't even know is out there yet. And it really does come at you in place that in the most surprising places. I mean, even the thing that I'm thinking about right now is even, um, Lana Del Rey's new album, Norman fucking Rockwell. I don't know Mm. if you've listened to it at all. And the reason I bring it up is because she has a lot of, uh, there's one song and now I'm now forgetting what it's called. (laughs) But basically it's, you know, the whole album is basically about like millennial burnout culture in the face Mm. of the planet being on fire. And one of the songs 
it goes, uh, you know, L.A. is in flames or uh, Life on Mars ain't just a song, you know, oh, like wow. it, it makes it, it really I think it's called oh, the greatest. Gotta... It's called the greatest. That's what it's. Okay. Yeah. You should definitely look it up because every single line in it is like, well, you know, it's it's essentially capturing this feeling that people wow. in my generation have of just is there even a future that we right. can look forward to? And and it's not comforting to listen to it, but it is certainly validating. <laughs> yeah, well, that, I mean, that, that that is such a great point because I I mean I think one of the one of the things that's changed in my teaching is that my students will inevitably bring in mat- so much more more material, and they feel safe doing that because they know that I'm not trying to, you know, maintain some strict canon of important works but rather i mean like we, last semester we read virginia wolf's orlando in one of my classes and my students were just bringing in material that they were you know one of my students got got really into thinking about how harry styles and orlando were like weirdly similar and so she would just bring in stuff that my, that my other students were getting so excited about and i was learning so much because this was new stuff to me but just creating that that space where students can can see very relevant ties to the creative work, artistic work happening, cultural work happening all around them right now that is often very um, somber and and earnest in in the way you're describing the Lana Del Rey album. I mean, these are real questions that that students have that I have too, but so much better if we can sort of tackle this material by being very um, current and not just being like, well, you know, Thoreau warned us about this, you know, (laughs) even if he... Did. But it also reminds me of last night I was doing the dishes and we were um, listening to the Frozen 2 soundtrack and my you know my daughter was dancing while I was doing the dishes. But I was listening to the one song um, that Anna sings about about um, doing the next right thing. I think it was it's called. And I was listening to the lyrics. and I was like, this is totally an Anthropocene song. And And in fact, I had that feeling when I watched the film with my kids a few months ago. But then listening to the lyrics, and I was like, whoa, I, you know, I. Love to take this into my talk to with my students about this. Um, so it's I don't know it, it's it's strange because this topic is so heavy. The book has a very um, melancholy aspect to it, but it's also made my my teaching and my reading and writing and even parenting um, just I don't know it, it like even more vivid and vital feeling. Uh, yeah, I mean, what is the general feeling that you get from from your students? I mean. Is there hopelessness? Is there melancholy? I mean, how are they reacting to the material that you're bringing to your classes? Yeah, there's a lot of melancholy and, and general hopelessness, I think, on at least on my campus. And my campus is actually pretty buoyant in a lot of ways. I mean, our students are very artsy and quirky and, you know, they're in bands and they're doing cool stuff. But still, there's a feeling of of kind of palpable just anxiety, I would say. I mean, this is partly why I'm working on this new book um, where I'm trying to think about depression, not as just like an individual experience, but as a kind of cultural ambient condition. Um, But I I think, you know, again, it's just, it's made me, it's made me completely um, re-evaluate and upturn all of my teaching practices and just want to make things very real for my students at every turn. So that it's like, this is not, this is not a drill. This is not an exercise for life. You know, like we're in it right now. (sighs) You're telling me. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah. I mean, so you just, you brought up your kids who play such a vivid role throughout this book, um, you know, walking them around your hometown in Michigan and also living with them in New in uh, New Orleans and, it's obviously impacted the way that you think about the Anthropocene and climate change. Do you think it makes you more aware of how your generation and previous generations before have been, are are leaving the world for them? Has it made you reevaluate the way you live or navigate the world? Oh, definitely. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's, uh, it's, it's, it's become a really tricky balancing act where, um, it's like how vulnerable and self-deprecating should I be to my to my kids? You know, like how honest should I be with them about like how messed up things are and how much like, you know, they love their grandparents. But, you know, do I 
you know, I, I don't necessarily need to get them to say, OK, boomer next time they see them. But that's kind of the feeling sometimes is like, you know, we, if I'm going to be honest with them, it's like we can point to very real things that 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 previous generations have have done to make life a lot you know, more pressurized right now um, and, and moving forward. So, um, yeah, I haven't got it figured out. And I feel like I make a lot of um, questionable parenting choices about like what to expose my kids to like my son's really into space travel right now. And so, mm. you know, it's like every weekend we have these long, you know, like we're building Legos, we're building space shuttles, but we're also trying to talk about like, well, you know, do humans really need to go to Mars? Maybe not. Like what, what, what if we didn't go to Mars? What if we used all that money here on earth, like doing something else? He's very curious about this Elon Musk character. You know, what, what, what is Elon Musk? Why is he so interested? He just, does he just want to be famous? Does he just want money? What is his deal? I, I don't know. But so we, we end up talking about these things and, um, yeah, I mean, it completely bleeds over into my my everyday parenting life, even as it you know then sort of fuels my further thinking and writing about this. I think my my students are really sick of hearing stories about my kids, but <laughs> but at the same time, it's like I can't just I cannot compartmentalize these things, you know. No, of course not. I mean, because you're leaving a future, or you're trying to leave a future for them. So of yeah, course, yeah. trying to shape everything that you do and say. Um, does your son have does he have like a positive or a negative opinion about Elon Musk or is he just fascinated by him? Oh, I think it definitely skews negative. Um, but, but I mean, he, he, he likes the idea of, you know, like I'll show him a launch, like, Oh, here's one of Elon Musk's, you know, rockets. And now look, they're going to land it. That's pretty amazing. Right. And he's like, well, that's pretty amazing. But why does he really want to do this? He's very, he's suspicious. Like, you know, what's he really after, you know? So <laughs> hopefully I'm, I'm cultivating a, a, a healthy skepticism um, in him. <laughs> yeah. It really sounds like you are. <laughs> yeah, I think that really poses a, a problem that I've been thinking about a lot. I mean, how how do we represent this crisis to, especially to small children? I mean, what is what is the line? Really? Yeah, yeah. And I mean, this is I was I was sort of I was guest teaching at a at a local um, arts high school a couple weeks ago, and. It was funny, even like going down, you know, just a couple few years. I think these were like these were ninth or tenth graders, and it was a creative nonfiction class. And even talking to them, I was I was sort of viscerally aware of, oh my gosh, like there are things I just don't feel like I can be as as forthright or bold about that I can be with college. I can get very real with them and sort of you know demand that we take things seriously and and not bullshit in a way that you know, with, with high school or, you know, probably middle school. I mean, I don't know how far down there's a weird kind of, um, you know, bell curve. I feel like where with little kids, you can be pretty blunt with them. And then there's a lot of like maybe psychological, um, you know, management that you have to do and filtering. But then by the time people are in college, it seems like once again, like you just gotta be real. We're not gonna, like, we're not gonna sugarcoat things here. So it, it made me glad. I mean, it reminded me why I think I'm, if I'm useful at all in the college classroom, it's because I can be relatively unfiltered with my students. But it, maybe it's also why I feel like there's such a strong line between my young children and my my college students right now. Well, I think you're certainly trying to protect them in some way. I mean, there's a there's the tension there, trying to protect them from the larger problem, whereas you know, but also trying not to scare them simultaneously. I mean, it, it must be <laughs> really difficult. Yeah. And I think also like in both cases, it's like with my little kids, I'm trying to get them equipped to, you know, go to school, you know, go to more school and, you know, go into like middle school and, and remembering that that's like an intense time, but like give them all the, you know, the equipment to do that. And then same with college students. I'm like, I'm trying to get them so that they can graduate and go on to hopefully really, meaningful lives and jobs. And so I think there's a, you know, weirdly, there's a, a similar kind of um, urgency. I, I mean, I do think that there there has been an urgency amongst, amongst children. I mean, speaking of children, I mean, how what is your take on the way that children are spearheading the climate change movement across the planet right now? Yeah, it's amazing. I mean, it's, it's, you know, I guess, unfortunately, Greta Thunberg has become like this singular, you know, kind of metonymy for this. But on the other hand, she has, and she's really, I've seen like how she's inspired my, my nieces up in Michigan, you know, my, who play with my kids, 
that um, she she's she's doing something there that that a lot of um, much more grown people have not been able to do, which is to put to put a very articulate point on 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 these issues, um, and it's really inspiring. And I think it's I think it's having ripple effects that um, you know sort of get get shouted down by by some adults, but um, hopefully will persist. Yeah, I mean, for me, when I look at it, I think the reason why I believe it it's it's been so powerful is because it's had such a sombering effect on the people that are supposed to be governing us. I mean, the children mm-hmm. turn to them and say, you're supposed to be protecting us. You're supposed to be ensuring a safe planet for us and a future. And you are committing a colossal moral failure by mm-hmm. not doing so. And I think it's it's brought a healthy dose of shame to governments across across the planet. I mean, well, not this one, obviously, but other governments. Yeah, and yeah. Yeah, I mean, there's nothing. They there's no way that adults can really counter that because if if they're especially with somebody like Greta Thunberg, I mean, she has at least now as a 17 year old, she has the defense of, look, I don't have the scientific answers for you because I am technically a child. But right, my right. point being is that you should have the answers. Yeah, yeah. No, I think that's right. And you know, I mean, we we're at this this political you know crux moment right now where you can. You could see things swinging, swinging in that direction very rapidly with the right, you know, hopefully the right changes given this next election. Um, you know, you could see those voices amplified even more. Um, but it's hard. It's hard to conceive of that right now. You know, at least I mean, here in, in the U.S. But um, but I think that, you know, that there's a lot of there's a lot of good, good movement in that direction coming from young people. Mm. I mean, it's it's clear from your anecdotes about classes and your children and, and with the climate change movement being spearheaded by children that on an individual level, people are scared, people are talking about it. But do you think that we're discussing it enough in popular media or do you think we could be doing a better job? Uh, yeah, absolutely. We could be doing a, a much better job. I mean, right now it tends to either um, get cast as a you know, a foregone conclusion. I mean, even the bestsellers like The Uninhabitable Earth or uh, The the Drowned World. No, 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 not The Drowned World. That's a J.G. Ballard novel. But um, The Drowned Earth, I forget what it's called. Um, Nathaniel Rich's book. But I mean, in in a lot of those cases, it's like, well, we could have done something, but we we didn't. And now we're screwed. Um, But I think that um, a lot more nuance needs to be brought to this and a lot more um, forward looking, like actually, what does it mean to to make changes, um, you know, not just on like a personal consumerist level, but on a on on you know larger circles of of cultural levels. You know, what kind of what kind of decisions can we make collectively together? Yeah, I think that there needs to be so much more conversation about it. And again, it's the kind of thing that you know you could see certain um, politicians given given the voice for that. I mean, AOC, who's, I mean, there, there's a, there's a strong, very clear sense of that um, with her, but uh, then there are unfortunately a lot of, a lot, there's a lot of denial too. So I guess on the one hand, there's, there's environmental disaster, foregone conclusion. On the other hand, there's just total denial. Like, I, I mean, I, I read a headline the other day that in the, in Trump's new budget, there's not a single mention of climate change anywhere. And so those seem to be the extremes right now. And there, there's, there's this, you know, huge space in the middle where, hey, there's actually there are real solutions here if if we care to to grapple with them. Which isn't to say it'll be easy, but <laughs> no, no, certainly not. But I mean, so one of the solutions that has been thrown around or ideas that has been thrown around is the Green New Deal. I mean, you just mm-hmm. mentioned AOC. Do you have any insights about the Green New Deal? Not really, but I think it was I mean. It was certainly something to to be. Um, I mean, it was like it was like one of those like first steps of awareness. Like, oh, this is like any any new economic deal. It'll only like it'll only be a deal if it's green. So even that, just on that simple kind of symbolic level, it's like that is a that's a start. You know, even if we want to think more, you know, in more complex ways about the you know green as an ecological metaphor or whatever. Still, it's like. We need that. We need, we need to be like 
leading with that rather than, you know, rather than just sort of keeping it as a side issue or something. Right. I mean, oh, so you just brought up green as a ecological metaphor. I mean, one thing that you also repeatedly said in your book is that you wanted to resist aestheticizing uh, the Anthropocene or aestheticizing nature. What what exactly do you mean by that? And why is it potentially an issue? Well, there's just, I mean, there's such a strong tradition in in Western literature and, and culture and philosophy of of having nature, especially nature, capital N, being this sort of, you know, unreachable, absolute, ideal form that we can what commune with or, or be inspired by, but is ultimately like totally separate from us. And that's um, to me, that's like the bedrock um, philosophical mistake that needs to be um, corrected to where it's like, no, there is, there's, a, there's, there's zero gap, there's zero difference between whatever we call nature. And whatever is going on in every single part of my body at every second. So part of being really aware of how we aestheticize nature um, and the Anthropocene is is being really cautious about when these things become um, absolute terms or concepts that seem to that seem to be outside of us or beyond our control, when in fact they're every bit a part of us. I, I sort of trace this I mean, back when, when I was working on a, a master's thesis in in like 2001, and I was I was focusing on SUV ads and looking at how SUV ads, just like magazine ads for you know Subarus or Blazers or Broncos, no, not Broncos so much at that point, but like Lincoln Navigators, at how they would set up this dynamic between you know the human driver and the natural you know background landscape. And so this has been a preoccupation of mine for quite some time to think about how um, popular culture, consumer culture, especially, you know, even if you don't think you're interested in nature or these kind of concepts, how these these ideas get sort of inculcated and um, uh, become become unconscious habits. How have uh, car ads sort of juxtaposed themselves to nature in, in your in the examples that you've encountered? Well, it's usually, I mean, the, the, the SUV is a, is an opportunity to like go out into nature and, you know, connect with it. But then also, you know, you've got your leather interior and your, you know, your audio deck and you've got all the, the sort of comforts of culture, but then you can experience nature. And so even as it tries to kind of, um, you know, give you the best of both worlds, just that idea of like these two distinct worlds does profound damage to the ways that we actually think about and interact with our everyday lives. Mm. Something to be conquered, something to be claimed as opposed to something that we are a part of. Right. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And something that we have to, I mean, that we have to on, on some level care for if we want to, you know, keep on as a, as a species for a while. Do you have any, I mean, I know that you're not a climate scientist, but do you have any tangible ideas that that embody some of the collective action that you are talking about that, you know, represent the togetherness, the oneness that we have with nature and with the ecosystem at large? Yeah, I mean, this this one might come off as a little hokey or we still haven't maybe digested it, but even I was listening to Joaquin Phoenix's um, Oscar award um, acceptance speech. And uh, did you, have, did you listen to it by any chance? Um, I read a headline about it, but I haven't had the chance to actually listen to it I yet. Mean, it's, it's quite fascinating because it's so, it's so passionate and troubled and fraught. And basically, I mean, basically he's, he's arguing for, we need to completely re, um, you know, retool, or we need to get rid of like the the um, industrial meat um, uh, complex or whatever we call it, um, and you know how we how we live with other animals and 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 understand that we are not the top animal on the food chain, but rather that we coexist with other animals. And he, I mean, it was very, it was. It was less than perfectly um, articulated, but it was a pretty impressive use of those three minutes to say, hey, here's an issue that that is, um, you know, systemic and it and it and it directly bears on this larger issue of climate change and environmental degradation 
And it's something that, um, you know, it, it was, I guess I'm just saying it was both impressive even for its, you know, kind of what, what could just be seen as like grandstanding or weirdly like, oh, now, now with that celebrity position of power, you can sort of say this, but what, what real effect does that have as it's filtered through the Oscar award ceremony? Um, mm-hmm. I still think it's just, it's, it's interesting that you have that, this kind of awareness making its way to that um, kind of public, um, you know, public audience. Right. I mean, it's uh, obviously the Oscars is like a great time for uh, celebrities to virtue signal. Um, right, right. And, and they've been doing that for uh, gender uh, representation and diversity within mm-hmm. the Academy as well. I think some of the criticisms, well, no, I mean, that's totally an aside that with at least those issues, it feels like it's just virtue signaling. But it's a it's a very good question. I mean, what what actual impact does it have when somebody like Joaquin Phoenix uses his three minutes to say um, that we are not the top animal? I mean, how, how does does it reach people? Does it get people having conversation to have conversations about it? I mean, right. I mean, I know, yeah. I mean, I noticed actually when I came into my class yesterday, I noticed one of my students was sitting there on her phone with her headphones in and she, I noticed she was watching the speech. And so uh, just as we were getting started, she pulled her headphone out. And I, I said, Sadie, were you, were you watching the Joaquin Phoenix speech? Said, yeah. Yeah. And what'd you think? So we started talking about it, you know, and it's like, even there, like that seems like a small thing, but you know, that he was saying something actually um, philosophically important and radical. And the, and the fact that it's like, it's now disseminating, there's something to be said for that. And I, I'm not sure like, you know, what's that gonna result in? It's probably not gonna result in the, you know, the, all the, the, the chicken farms and factories closing in the next couple of weeks. But, you know, the, there, I, I guess, you know, the one possible upshot of social media, digital media ecosystem is that um, messages can, you can move quickly and can metastasize in maybe, you know, maybe positive ways. I mean, we know they can in certain cases, but we've also seen that they can have real negative effects too. So that's something I'm ambivalent about. Another, another topic, I guess. (laughs) I mean, I, I think on a personal note, I do think it has some impact because one of the reasons why things have taken such a terrible toll in the climate crisis is because we pretended for so long that it didn't exist. Right. And in, in media, even in major publications like the New York Times, you know, for so long we were writing about hurricanes and not acknowledging some of the ways that climate change makes natural disasters worse. And it hasn't been until very recently that that is part of the critical assessment of these issues. And I think the fact that Right. The fact that we're talking about it means that it's no longer invisible. Um, right. So. Right. And it becomes know. harder to deny. It becomes harder to just flat out deny. Right. I mean. No, it does become a lot harder to deny. Um, I wanted to talk a little bit more about the book that you're about to write or that you're currently writing, Pedagogy of the Depressed. First of all, incredible title <laughs> um, for you know, people who don't know, it's a reference to pedagogy of the oppressed. <laughs> but uh, yeah, can you talk a little bit more about what that book is is going to explore? Yeah, yeah. I, I, I mean, I've, I've uh, a lot of the, uh, I've written a lot of essays over the last um, couple of years, I guess, since I finished searching for the Anthropocene about just the 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 changing feel of the college classroom certainly in my experience, but also with, you know, conversations I've had with numerous friends and colleagues um, around and just thinking about how these changes are affecting, you know, how we teach, um, how our students feel about higher education, feel about the future, feel about their um, technologies and how how technologies are are changing their lives. you know, whether it's things like online education or smartphones or um, um, online um, learning management platforms. So I've been I just I, I've been writing a lot about my own experiences, kind of trying new things and resisting other things, um, but also just kind of describing experiences I've had in the classroom that that where things feel different. I guess the whole thing comes from just you know, I've been teaching at the college level for, I guess, about 19 years. And it feels like like for the first 15 or so, 
I think like things felt basically the same. And then over the last four years, it just like things ch- started changing very quickly um, at both like the institutional level and in the technological realms that then like flooded into the classroom. And I mean, so much of this is echoing like larger cultural changes and pressures, but I'm just trying to look at it as like, okay, like what's going on here in the classroom and how can I shed some light on these different facets? It's certainly not, it's not as, um, you know, theoretical as a book, as pedagogy of the oppressed and neither is it as like, as it, it's not as politically precise as, as that book was. Um, but it's supposed to be more of like an, kind of an impressionistic survey of different kind of scenes and shifts as, as I've kind of been tracking them. And you feel like it's a, it's a follow up to this. Book. Yeah, it really feels like a follow up. I mean, it, it well, for instance, I mean, I'll, I think I, so as I was finishing searching for the Anthropocene, our new airport was on the verge of opening and our old airport was about to become completely obsolete and that's something I write about in that book mm-hmm. in the toward the very end and then this book I think will open with the new airport opening um which I've which I've kind of been well I've been following pretty closely and I've gone I went to like an open house and toured it before it opened and then I've I've gone in and out of it and picked up my parents at it and so it doesn't sound like something that would really be in a book called Pedagogy of the Depressed but I, I teach a class called Interpreting Airports at my university that, um, and I'm going to be teaching it again next fall. So I'm going to be tying it into how I, you know, how I teach students to think about air travel and not just as like this thing we happen to do from time to time, but as something that's woven into all these other parts of our modern lives. Um, so I'm hoping that, that, that transition works. I guess my hope is that if anyone were to read these three books, they would see them as really like, you know, three parts of a, of a much larger project, much in the way that my first three books about airports were very much like three beats in a, in a, in a kind of complete set. I say kind of complete because I didn't plan it that way. It just worked <laughs> out. It just worked out that way. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So we are about to be out of time, but on a final note, do you, and this might sound a bit hokey, but are you hopeful for the future in this geological era defined by destructive humanity? Is I'm there hope- a reason to be hopeful? Yeah. I'm hopeful when I when I'm with my students and when I'm with my kids. That's probably when I'm the most hopeful. I'm probably the least hopeful when I'm, you know, bombarded by by headlines or you know, listening to screeds or you know, dire predictions. That's when I'm the least hopeful. But when I you know, when I'm with when I'm with younger generations, that's when I that's when and where I, I find hope. Well, I mean, it's it's hard, but that's really all we have going for us. And and I think a healthy dose of fear coupled with hope is is the way forward for some action to actually be taken. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Um, I'm struggling with a lot of these issues myself. I felt really seen by your book or called out by your book because it's something no matter how great my personal life is going on a day-to-day basis, I have this sort of undergoing existential existential dread that carries with me no matter what at this point where I'm just, yeah. I'm just oh, God, you know. Yeah. Is there a point? I, these are yeah. scarier questions that I'm asking myself, I guess. No, totally. I mean, I am too every day. And I mean, I mean, I feel like I've got to be that point of hope in a weird way for my students who are asking these kind of questions, you know, like why? What's the point? It's like, well... You could do better things than, you know, than I did or my parents did. And, you know, like, I believe that, you know, and, and I think there is, the, you know, there is like the, there is the political will for this. It's just that right now we've got this incredibly stubborn, dying patriarchy mm. that just won't go away, you know? <laughs> Amen. <laughs> it's almost, I don't know. It's almost like, I, I feel like I've got to, and I really, I think I really piss off a lot of my colleagues, to be honest, because I feel like these days I'm just using my you know, my stupid limited little point of authority as a professor to kind of undermine authority, you know, for my students and be like, look, you, you know, this is, this is all about you all. This isn't about me. This isn't about my ego. This isn't about you all repeating what we all think is important. This is about like, 
you know, let's do stuff that matters. And I don't know, it's, uh, it's made teaching a lot more meaningful over the last few years, but it's also made it kind of more like I have many more moments of just feeling like I mean, speaking of like existential crisis, like just like sheer vertigo in the classroom. Cause I'm just like, I have just like lost control and they can tell that I don't know the answer <laughs> and who's going to freak out first, basically. Right. Yeah. Yeah. The fear feels paralyzing, but I don't know. Then I think about the fact that we are value. We create value. And if if everybody actually took collective action and refused to produce or provide the labor for these massive industries that are committing 90 percent of the problem, yep. even for like a week, I don't know. I think. Absolutely. I think there would be massive global change. And I do, too. Yeah, it's 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 thoughts like that that I think keep me going yeah yeah and I know it's it's sort of like making like drawing just drawing like awareness of that to students like hey you know what like just think about if everyone just quit if Twitter really if like 60 percent of Twitter users just decided yeah you know what this isn't this is only helping like Donald Trump and his minions or whatever you know however you want to frame that let's stop and boom what happens then you know how abruptly could you just like shake up a and I'm not necessarily saying that's like the best strategy, but I'm just saying like when you look at these things that, I mean, how collective action could change something so abruptly. Well, thank you so much for being on the show. Uh, for everybody listening, you can find Chris's book, Searching for the Anthropocene on Bloomsbury's website. Um, yeah, no, this has been a great conversation. Very enlightening. Yeah, thank you so much, Rebecca. I really appreciate your interest and your great questions. 